Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including that Charlie dude, Justin Zellers, Pepper Geesey, and brand new patron Liz. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, we know the future of cable TV's survival and will tell you. Plus, Big Tech crushes some small apps, and Scott Johnson tells us what Epic's new Unreal Engine royalties will mean for you as a gamer, or as a user, or just as a person. We love you as a human. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 2nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. Hey, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang, and I'm hey, right here. Hey, indeed. You're right there. Where you're, wherever you are, there you are. Yep. It's true. <laughs> wherever you go, there you wherever are. Wherever you find where, yourself, where, where, there you'll be. Where is that from? Wherever you go, there you are. Uh, the somebody Adventures said of that. Buckaroo Banzai. I think. Is it really? Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. I, I, I thought that. it was like a famous poet or something. I yes, mean, it's been that reused. Famous poet, in... Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> <laughs> I've read all the works by Mr. Bonsai. It's fantastic. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. All right, let's get right into it with the quick hits. Microsoft launched Office 2024. This is a standalone, non-subscription version of its productivity suite for Mac and PC users. The version includes core apps like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, but it doesn't offer continuous feature updates the way it would for Microsoft 365 subscribers. Office 2024 is available as a one-time purchase. Prices start at $150 for the home version, $250 for the home and business version, and that includes Outlook and also allows for commercial use. WordPress parent company Automatic's dispute with WP Engine, a major user of WordPress.org software, continues. Here's the latest. On Wednesday, Automatic published a proposed deal from September 2023 that would have it taking 8% of WP Engine's revenue in exchange for either continued use of the WordPress trademark or paying salary WP Engine employees to contribute to the open source WordPress.org project. WP Engine declined either option. Automatic is now allegedly restricting WP Engine's customers from updating or installing WordPress themes and plugins. Uh, actually, it's not automatic. It's WordPress.org is restricting WP Engine's customs from updating or installing WordPress themes or plugins, escalating the situation and affecting users uh, across the spectrum. So basically, the the, the short version is uh, Word Automatic said, here's the thing they're mad at and put it out for everyone to see. And it was, they wanted a huge amount for licensing the trademark or more likely what they were trying to do is force them to contribute to the open source project. And the open source project is saying, you can't use our update system until you change your ways. So it's two on one. Yep. Uh, this, uh, I did not have this on my bingo card. No, the, wor the, the word, <laughs> like, you know, who, who's who, um, it, uh, it, uh, it continues, but yep. Yeah, uh, interesting stuff. Um, also interesting Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports. Apple is ready in a new iPhone SE four and an upgraded iPad air lineup. The SE four would reportedly lose the home button switching to face ID and sport a sleeker edge to edge display like the iPhone 14. Definitely Apple's budget friendly model, but with some premium features. On the tablet side, the new iPad Air would reportedly come with internal improvements. There's talk of an updated Magic Keyboard to complement the device as well. It looks like Apple is going to kick off the, the next year, which we're almost at at this point, with some upgrades to more of the affordable devices. Now, we don't usually cover venture capital raises because they happen all the time, and they're really mostly exciting for the company that's raising the capital. Uh, but this one's big enough that it's worth noting. OpenAI just raised $6.6 .6 billion dollars valuing the company at 157 billion. Remember what? when we thought, ooh, one Instagram, a billion dollars. Uh, this is 157 Instagrams. Uh, backers include Microsoft and NVIDIA, uh, participation from Thrive Capital, Coastal Ventures, some others. Uh, OpenAI is supposedly planning to transition from being a capped 
profit subsidiary of its nonprofit parent to be an, an uncapped profit entity independent of its nonprofit parent. Uh, and that would allow them to make some aggressive revenue projections. We're talking $3.6 billion this year, up to $11.6 billion next year. Axios reports its sources are saying OpenAI's investors have terms as part of this fundraise that they will get their money back if that transition to an uncapped profit company has not completed within two years. What could go wrong? <laughs> NVIDIA announced its own family of multimodal language models, the largest of which is the 72 billion parameter LVLMD72B. I knew it was going to get that wrong. NVIDIA says its benchmarks are comparable to OpenAI's GPT-4. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, let's talk, let's talk cable bundles, shall we? Uh, Charter Cable has agreed to distribute Comcast's Peacock to its cable TV customers for no additional charge. That means if you subscribe to Spectrum Cable, which Charter owns, you'll get Peacock as part of your monthly service, just like you get a variety of cable TV channels. Charter currently offers Disney+, Plus, ESPN+, Plus, Warner Brothers Discovery's Max, Discovery+, Plus, Paramount Global's Paramount Plus, BET Plus, everybody has the plus. AMC Networks' AMC Plus, um, Univision's VIX, all as part of your monthly Spectrum TV Select subscription. So if you are a subscriber of this, you might say, oh, cool, that, you know, awesome, I get something for free um, or, you know, something for whatever I'm already paying for um, that's, that's now bundled in. I think for uh, a lot of uh, other folks, myself included, who do everything a la carte, I wonder how attractive cable can make itself at this point. Mm, at this stage of the game? Yeah. So that's, I've, I'm with you. I don't know the answer to that, and I'm also very skeptical of it. It feels like um, we've been on a road for a while now where that will slowly chip away in favor of where we're headed. But I also see a lot of people in my circles complain that they've now got 12 subscriptions and those subscriptions equal or, or exceed the amount they were paying for cable. And then I have to remind them, well, the nice thing is you don't have a two-year contract to break. You can just cancel these whenever you want and not use the ones you're not using, assuming they're not using all 12. But even if they are using all, all 12 of those, it's still not an apples to apples comparison. So my expectation was well before this that we would see more cable companies as as few as there are bundling these into their services to try to bridge that gap or to create some sort of hey you love our our live sports and our live events and the things you just can't quite get right on streaming services yet or not in their full you know way uh NFL packages that sort of thing so keep coming here for that. But also, we know you want to kind of have some of this, too. So here's the thing for your iPad when you're on the road and you can watch Peacock while you're, you know, not around or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I am, I am a YouTube TV subscriber. It's $73 a month. Um, it has crept up <laughs> over the last few years. It started at like 50 um, So it's not as affordable as it used to be. But that's the way I watch sports. I mean, I can't get every single, you know, like an NFL package would be something, uh, uh, you know, on top of that. But it's the way I watch local news, you know, watching the VP debate, for example. It's like, how else am I going to do that? Like, I need some sort of a cable bundle type thing. Um, right. and, and then sports. So so you you have options. But I think, you know, more more so we're we're... We're in this era where, you know, um, and we talk about this a lot on the show is like, oh, Disney Plus, you know, subscribers, you know, lost a lot of subscribers because they don't have like that hit show. You can't you can't expect everybody to subscribe to 12 different streaming services and pay more than they would for cable. And, you know, when when most of most of this is really a lean back situation already. 
Mm. Increasingly, all the stuff you're talking about that you get from YouTube TV is showing up in these services. Sports is showing up on Peacock. Sports is showing up on Max. It News is. News is showing up on Peacock. News is showing up on Max. But you uh, have to you kind are, of like hunt and peck. You are getting closer and closer to not needing cable for much of anything. Mm. Uh, and you are close to venue launching, which would take three of the five major sports TV providers into one service. Uh, you're close to ESPN being, being available independently. So we are seeing more and more of these things go into the services. Uh, there has been a lot of work done that shows even if you buy a bunch of these things, it's still cheaper than a cable subscription. Usually when people complain, it's because like you, Sarah, you're saying, I need YouTube TV and these other things. As more of this stuff moves into it, you won't need YouTube TV to get these things. You'll be able to get it from the other stuff. But to your last point, what's frustrating is you have to hunt and peck. You have to be like, okay, maybe it is cheaper, but I've got 12 different subscriptions right. to manage and, it's like, and it's logins like it's to remember. Okay, so that's where exactly. I go to Amazon and for Which football. one is that on? And yeah. what Spectrum is wisely doing is saying to you, hey, wouldn't you just like to have it all in one place with one login, your Spectrum login? Well, and we'll the pay answer, the bill. The is yes. You just pay us and you won't have to think about it. Yeah. Uh, and to their existing TV subscribers, they're saying, hey, I know you guys are confused about all this stuff that Sarah was talking about on DTNS because it sounds like a nightmare. We'll take care of it. We'll give you Peacock. We'll give you BET Plus. We'll give you ESPN Plus. And you just log in. You don't have to go anywhere. And eventually, the cable TV part of this is going to dwindle to almost nothing. And right. they'll be paying for someone to provide all of these app services to them. At least that's what Spectrum hopes. That looks like the future of cable TV provisions. It looks like what DirecTV wants to do with the combined dish DirecTV that's supposed to close at the end of next year. So the question for, for you as a viewer is, would you like to risk you know, losing access to your apps because there's a carriage dispute down the line, uh, risk having your fees go up with you having no control of whether you can cancel individual services for the convenience of just having one bill? Or would you like to maintain the control of like, I can decide which ones to have, I can adjust my budget, I've got no contracts, but I have to keep track of, you know, a dozen or more different services. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the choice we're given now, it looks like. Yep. Yeah. Or at least close to it. All right, we have a tale of two apps removed by the world of big tech. Uh, one is called Juno, J-U-N-O, made by Christian Selig. Uh, he also made the Apollo Reddit reader, if you remember that story. Uh, so here he is again, fighting an app store removal. Uh, Juno wrapped up the YouTube website in a shell for the Apple Vision Pro. It did not use the YouTube API. It just added the ability to view the YouTube website in 360 or 180 degrees, use gesture control for the playback functions, interpret voice controls for the playback functions. But YouTube says that violates our API terms and, quote, strongly alludes to YouTube's trademarks and iconography, and Apple has removed it from the App Store. Selig says he's not going to fight that. Separately... Ryu Jinx was a Nintendo Switch emulator. It didn't distribute any pirated games, just emulated the processors in the Switch. And the assumption was it was under Brazilian law. We don't know that for sure, but that's what everybody thought. And therefore, because Brazilian law is more emulator friendly, it could resist lawsuits being filed against it. But it's now gone, too, from its own website and from GitHub. One of the developers said in Discord and on X that Nintendo, quote, offered an agreement to stop working on the project, and you can fill in and, the rest, is basically it, what they and were and saying. An agreement, like, meaning we paid you to stop we, doing I, this. Maybe, maybe. We don't know. We don't, we don't know. know. I mean, I don't know what other kind possible. of agreement, you know, uh, yeah. probably more than a handshake, but yes. I have no idea. have no yeah. idea. They didn't say. They yeah. uh, can't say. They're probably legally prohibited from saying mm -hmm. by that same agreement, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, here we got two... You know, you can argue that the IP implications uh, of either of these, you know, might be egregious and therefore they should be stopped. But these were two innovative apps trying to help you access uh, content in a different way that big tech has stopped on. And now you can't. Well, here's a case. So in the Nintendo case, in the Switch emulator, we've had a couple of these go down by the wayside recently because Nintendo rattled their sabers and made threats and 
Uh, this is just another in that long line, and that's nothing new either. Over the decades, Nintendo's been very litigious about this sort of thing. Um, meanwhile, there's a lot of players who you know talk a lot of talk about, hey, we want to have a preservation thing in place. The companies aren't doing it for us, so we're going to do that with these emulators. And it is not illegal to make an emulator and it, for anything. It uh, doesn't matter what console or what brand or what any, any of that stuff. You can make them. But I also think Nintendo f- probably feels like they're on pretty solid ground, given the fact that these emulators are not they they are not illegal in and of themselves. But there is nothing in law that will, that is supposed to allow me to play, let's in this case say, Switch games on this emulated on this emulation software on a PC or a Steam Deck or wherever. Yeah, um, especially because Switch games are copyright protected. So if right. you were to circumvent that copyright protection in the United States and a lot of other places, you would be violating a law that prohibits you from circumventing copyright protection. Exactly. So there's a lot of like people know what it's for but aren't saying what it's for. Um, yeah. Thing is though, I do think in the long run, uh, I said this on TMS today when you were on, I think that nature finds a way. Uh, emulation always ends up happening and it's good in the long run. It does create preservation where there is none. Um, and I think that it's easy to see this and go, oh, that's it for Switch's future, you know, whatever. But remember, this is a current generation console for them. It's old now, in 2017 now, it's been a bit of time. But it's still a current gen product for them. This is what they're making games for before they release anything new. Come to me 10 years later, there'll be five, six, seven, eight of these. Is how it always goes. That's how it is right now for previous Nintendo hardware. You want SNES uh, cores and, and emulators? Hundreds of them, <laughs> literally. So I, I don't think people should get too worked up over this uh, in, in, the, in the long term. There, there will be preservation on that front. But for those who are just using it because they don't want to pay for the games, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's Piracy is illegal, so... Yeah, you know, and there's an argument that if somebody did have the resources to take Nintendo to court when they were threatened, uh, Nintendo could still win, saying you're encouraging distribution yeah. of piracy because there's no other thing you can use that isn't pirated. There's no other use case for the thing. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. Now, in the Juno case, though, Tom, this is the one that throws me because I it don't seems get like this. any of us could make like a little doohickey and why are they getting targeted? Let me say, I don't get, I don't get Apple cooperating with this. Uh, I'm curious where that comes from, but they're not violating the YouTube API unless Selig's just lying. Uh, and I know why YouTube wants it out of there because YouTube is bargaining with Apple uh, over app store provisions and revenue well, that, sharing. So and, that's, that's and so why. YouTube doesn't. Yeah, but why would Apple cooperate? Yeah, what because get out of because it? it's trying to you know be on good terms with the YouTube folks. That would guess be my so. guess. I guess so, but I mean, the but fact that this is in terms of the YouTube folks, at least not on this issue. Well, right? The fact that yeah, it's I not even the fact that it's not I mean, even interfering with actual kind of API I'm with that. or it doesn't yeah. use the API. Yeah, this that, one's a, this one's weird. weird. Uh, you know, especially um, Christian Selig, who. You know, is the 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 you know the lead developer on this just saying like, all right, well, I'll just I'll just take it away. It was a hobby project anyway. Oh oh well, kind well, of thing. Well, that's what he does. He does these things as a hobby, and he he fought back with Apollo uh, when Reddit started charging for the API, uh, but it didn't it didn't work, and he ended up saying like, well, I can't afford to keep doing it. So yeah, he's yeah. probably like, I don't want to do this again. Um, but um, this is an app that, um, as a Vision Pro owner, um, I have I've played around with. It was really cool. Um, I I I don't think anybody would think that it was a YouTube property, um, and that's you know obviously what YouTube's going for is like no people yeah, are confused it's conf- using our trademark right yeah, yeah. yeah like you we Just you don't buy it. you didn't you know you don't work for us type thing. I don't really I, I I don't think that's what's going on. I think it's just sort of I don't know. Apple's usually such a stickler for the rules that they'll be like, sorry, yeah. YouTube, he's not using your API. We're not going to remove it. But um, either Selig is glossing it over and there was something else under the hood that YouTube could latch on and get Apple's well, very rule the following people. Thing also but he wasn't using messy. the trademark. He was he he was only saying but for YouTube, YouTube which is in YouTube's own it. guidelines. Yeah. They say that, but where? Where was he doing that? Yeah. Like I, the, I don't see the evidence of that. That's the weird part. If it's not all logoed up and looking like YouTube made this thing, right? Then I, Sarah, it, seems like it wasn't a, all logoed up, was it? No. Yeah. yeah. Weird. 
I mean, that's other weird. than having the YouTube logo when you loaded YouTube, which also happens in a browser, that's the yeah. I think yeah. I think you honestly, I think YouTube was like, we should have made this up ourselves. Let's get this guy out of here. And maybe. Then I mean, I hope they do because it's a really that, cool. That, that would be my guess. Yeah. I hope yeah. they do. I it, like if they're going to kick people out for making something good, and making your product better. Make it, it good. Yeah, make pay it him better. to do it. Studies for companies being big enough to crush innovation. These are innovative uses for apps. Not all innovative uses of apps are illegal. So you can decide that both of these were illegal, and you'd be ter perfectly reasonable to do so. But these are definitely cases of this is what people going after antitrust say: when you're too big, you crush innovation. These are the kinds of things you see. I, I don't disagree with that. I think that's true. Maybe you do disagree with that, and you can tell us in our Discord, and we'll all respond, uh, or at least <laughs> I will, because you'll be saying it to me probably. Uh, in our Discord, you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Epic is dropping its royalty rates from 5% to 3.5% for games made with the Unreal Engine. The games also have to be made available on the Epic Game Store on launch day. The change is part of the company's Launch Everywhere with Epic program, which begins January 1st, 2025. All right, Scott, so what do you think is behind this move, and how does it affect developers and, and gamers? Well, okay, so if you're, if you're a developer, this is great. Anything that gives you more of the bottom line when your game sells, the better. Um, and this is good for them. This is good for devs. As far as gamers go, this isn't really going to affect you, at least not right now. Um, the one thing you'll notice here is this is not them saying you must publish on Epic's game store exclusively for any period of time. They still do deals with people, but they're not saying, hey, everybody, make sure it's on the Epic store only for some period of time or only in perpetuity. They're just saying launch day, it needs to be there. If it's on Steam, fine. If it's on consoles that day, great but we need to be part of the launch lineup. I think that's perfectly reasonable for them to do while posturing with this lower rate, right? I think that actually is okay. Yeah, they're not prohibiting you from no. doing otherwise. They're just saying they'll give you a break on the cost, right? And they really can't. I mean, they kind of, they're in a weird position right now. So here's the other reason why I think this is going on and why they're they're sweetening the deal for sort of across the board. Um, they kind of have it all locked in when it comes to big AAA titles. The, this, this is the engine to go to, and it's where the big hits are coming from when it comes to big, ultra-realistic, effects-heavy games um, from big companies that don't have their own engine. Um, where they've lost ground in recent years, even with Unity's problems, uh, is Unity and a little engine called Godot, or Godot. I forget how people are supposed to say it. I would say good dogs. I think of the actor, the actress. But anyway, it's uh, <laughs> it's an up and coming uh, engine that a lot of people are starting to move to as their solution for their middleware sort of B tier indie games, and they're losing a lot of ground to the Unity and Godot. As a result, I think they want to get some of that stuff back. Um, a huge portion of Steam's revenue comes from that category. Like, there's big titles, absolutely. But the biggest reason Steam eats their lunch in the store category is because they have a ton of that middleware and it's all really great. And people aren't necessarily jumping to to uh, the Unreal Engine to do these things. And oftentimes Unreal feels like it's too big to be even needed for this. I need a, a cute little side scrolling throwback to the to the 90s. Do I really need Unreal to do that? You can kind of do that with anything. And I think they want to remind people that, yes, you could use Unreal for that. And you might actually make a little more money because we're not going to take as much fee as we did before. So I think this is a, not an olive leaf. This is an extended hand to that community to say, hey, you know, let's let's get Unreal in, in more hands. Um, I think this is good. It's been a very difficult uphill thing for them with the store competition. There were, uh, you know, there were there were feelings at the beginning of, beginning of that. If they gave us enough free games on Epic, which they still do every month, and if they had enough exclusives, timed or otherwise, uh, with you know big names like Ubisoft and and others, uh, Gearbox is another one, then that would push them ahead. That would give them the traction they needed to at least go toe to toe with Steam, if not exceed them. And it hasn't happened. It's been years now, many years. And it just hasn't happened. They don't have even close to the market share. Despite having one of the most popular games in the history of video games with Fortnite, they're just not there. So I think this is also a way 
to boost that, saying if you launch here on day one, that means we're going to have your games, which means we get more traction over here. People will stay here longer. They'll get out of Fortnite and go, oh, what's this? And have a bunch more choices to go with. So this is it's kind of a win across the board. I don't really see any negatives here. Um, the only time it starts to get negative is when they start talking exclusivity, when it's like it's only on the Epic Store and you can't go anywhere else uh, to get this deal. Uh, they're not doing that here. So I actually think this is a pretty good move by the company. And probably to me and others who are just like, well, wait, what does it mean for my $30 game I'm about to buy? Really nothing at this stage. Um, they start swinging out more exclusivity and that kind of stuff, then we can talk. But I, I, I think this is actually a safe place for players and beneficial for developers who are looking to get a little more than they were getting uh, when they sell their games. Yeah, it relieves some price pressure, too. I don't think it's going to lower the price of games, but it, it it's one less pressure that would push the price to go up. Yeah. Uh, and if people don't realize, you have to make a million dollars in revenue off your Unreal Engine powered product before you pay any of this right so small this doesn't affect small developers just starting out this is like i'm start. i'm bringing in the big bucks uh and so now i have to kick in they also did an interesting thing where they are waiving that five percent fee for ios games mm -hmm. uh and again most of the world you can't list third-party apps in, in the ios app store anyway but in europe there's third-party app stores like epic store so you can list an ios app version in the epic store but you have to pay apple's core technology fee so an acknowledgement that you're gonna have to pay that core technology fee epic is saying we won't make you pay the five percent even if you don't list it in the epic store at launch day uh because we know that this is a pain in the ass yeah exactly and the epics game the epic game store uh, pc side same thing applies with the royalties waived if if you sell through there they're not going to charge mm -hmm. you those royalties because again you're in their garden that's where they want you to be yeah yeah i i, I, I think these are all positive moves that gives Developers, a few more options. The biggest question I have, and it's real nitty gritty, and maybe some devs will write in and, and talk about it. But if I wanted to make a game that I knew was going to be just for PCs, that's the only place I wanted to put it. Well, then it would end up on the Epic Game Store and perhaps Steam and maybe GOG or something like that. Um, is Epic going to require me as a developer to put it in their iOS European Epic Game Store? Maybe, or uh, you know, some other Android equivalent? Like I don't know. Because if these games aren't designed for certain platforms, how much wiggle do you have yeah, in yeah. this agreement? And and that stuff will will probably suss out over time. But um, overall, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a positive thing for the for the engines business, which is bigger and more competitive than ever. Thank you, Scott, for walking us through that. Sure. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Russell, who writes. I heard Chris Christensen mention Joby on the show Tuesday. I was walking through New York's Grand Central Station on my way home, and there was a Joby air taxi sitting in one of the halls. See the attached photo. Pretty cool to see in person. I hope this gets legs, as the Uber from the Upper West Side of Manhattan to Newark can be a bit painful, and this would be much better. Russell says, keep up the great work. Really like how DTNS has been evolving. Oh, thank you, Russell. It's been nice having you walking the streets of New York with us uh, for the past 10 years, sending us pictures like this. I love the big crate in the background that said Joby, <laughs> in, ca like in case you didn't know. I mean, at uh, first, I would, like when I saw the photo, at first I was like, oh, it's big. And I'm like, well, but, you know, you got to yeah. carry things. You got to, so. yeah, it's pretty yeah. big uh, this uh was it joby that had the one at ces this past year earlier this year i think it might have been i think yeah. it was yeah. yeah so they're they're they've just been carrying that thing around setting it up uh in big halls <laughs> I guess. grand central yeah. want to see it here it is mm -hmm. um well thank you russell and thanks to everybody who writes and if you have questions comments feedback send it our way feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com scott johnson you just keep on coming back that's all yeah. I ask of you. Mm. And uh, what else uh, do you have going on when you're well, not with us? Well, every Wednesday, I promise to do that, when I, whenever there's a Wednesday to be had. So I will be here. But here's <laughs> what else I'm doing. So um, I love the fall. Uh, it gets real crazy and interesting around here. Not just the shows and all that, but we like to do a thing every October, we're making it more official this year. But my daughter and I are doing what we're calling Frogtober. We're basically drawing something every day, Halloween-related, <laughs> And we started yesterday. Today, a little bit later today, frogpants.com will have a page dedicated to the results of our art. Plus, we're going to include a bunch of community art because we have them playing along with us. 
So if this sounds like fun and you just want to dust off your old pen, you can even just take pictures of stuff. It doesn't have to be digital. You can submit it right to this form. I'll get all the details up there for you. But go check it out, and you might have some fun with the shows and other stuff there, too. That's frogpants.com. You, but, but make the art yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Make the art. Don't generate AI because I can see it. <laughs> I can see it a thousand miles away. It is not hard for me to tell. Six so fingers. Don't yeah. even try. Yeah. Or, or sour cream that looks like ice cream on your tacos that yeah. I tried to generate and posted on Instagram yesterday. Yeah. That, that was fun. Yeah, nice job I saw that. It was great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Target has the technology to let your shoes grow with your feet. We'll discuss. We will. Uh, just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>